Now before the children go out to the teaching crash, we'll read just again from the scriptures. And we're turning this morning for our first reading to the book of Romans in chapter 10. The book of Romans and to the 10th chapter. Romans chapter 10. And we'll break into the chapter at verse number 6. Romans chapter 10 and to verse number 6. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down from above. Or, who shall descend into the deep? That is, to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And then if you'll just turn over to 1 Corinthians in chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And we'll break into this chapter at verse number 9. Verse number 9. But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things which are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Spirit teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. We'll end the reading there. And we know the Lord will bless the reading of his. <clears throat> That's good singing again. And it's good to be able to worship. And it's good to praise the Lord and give him all the glory. Now last week, you remember we began to look at what we called, that big word, the transcendence of God. And we found out as we started to study uh, through these things, we realized that, I hope for most, that it wasn't really a difficult word to understand at all. Transcendence just really being that big theological word. I don't know where these men get the words from. But that big word just meaning that God is high, that God is lofty, that God is above all things. One who is above all and outside anything our finite minds could ever imagine or could ever come to possibly understand. And we th found as we were going through these certain things that we find that God, he transcends our world, he transcends our universe. And then we find that he transcends our words. And then we find that he transcends even the greatest of thoughts that we could ever think about him. And so what we're going to think about this morning is the opposite of God's transcendence, and that is God's 
imminence. If transcendence is God's greatness in separation, well then God's imminence is that he is able to draw alongside. And he is able to meet us at any problem or any point or any trial within our lives. And so eminence could really be defined like this. Even though God is outside this universe, he is not so abstract that he does not care and is not intimately acquainted and concerned with the affairs of men and with the affairs of his creation. You see, some would have us believe that God is a great creator and the great divine maker of all things was just like the watchmaker. He created the world, he wound it up as it were, and he let it go just to finish out its course of time as long as that might be. That God is so transcendent, that God is so outside everything and anything that he has created that he is absolutely no part in the running and the working and the affairs of his creation. But then there's others on the opposite hand, and these are the two extremes. And they would have us believe that God is not so transcendent, but that he is so imminent that he is in absolutely everything. That God is, I suppose you could say, the blade of grass upon the lawn. That God is the cloud in the sky. That God is the cup of water that we would drink out of. And without me giving any more uh, illustrations or definitions, you can see that that isn't a scriptural concept either. So how do we find the middle ground in the word of God? Well, it's simply like this. God's transcendence, he is above all things. But God's imminence, he is able to draw near. He is able to meet us at the point of our need. And brothers and sisters, one of the greatest things this morning is this, is that yes, our God is great. But there is not a difficulty that you and I will ever face that the providential hand of God will not be in. And the providential hand of God will not oversee. And that God knows everything that will come to pass before it ever even comes to pass. Now, if you want to turn with me, please, to Genesis, please, chapter 3. I want us to see the transcendence of God and the eminence of God alongside one another. And then just pick up a few truths out of this marvelous portion of Scripture. So Genesis, chapter 3, I'm beginning to read at verse number 6. You see, even though our God sits, as it were, in regal splendor and brilliance, Nevertheless, he is willing, as it were, to rise off his lofty throne and come down to meet man and woman at the point of their need. And we see that here in Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. Let's just take the time to read these few verses of Scripture. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and the tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam, And said unto him, Where art thou? You see, when we turn to Genesis chapter 3, we're not only taking a look at the transcendence of God, but we're seeing in this portion of Scripture, in Genesis chapter 3 in particular, and those couple of verses that we read, the imminence of God, God drawing alongside. You see, really the first two chapters of our Bibles Show us the mighty workings and the mighty creation and the creatorial power of God. 
You find there he creates all with the word of his power. In the first two chapters of Genesis. He speaks that which is in existence. And brings it into being. That had never yet been before. And so the first two chapters God creates all things. He creates the heavens. He creates the earth. He furnishes them all with beauty. And then he places man and woman which he has created in the garden. But I want you to notice something. And we only get this little insight because of Adam and Eve's fall. Look again at verse number 8. Look what it says. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. You see, God had not only created the universe and not only created the world, but he is now coming down to commune with the man and the woman that he had created and placed upon this earth. I love that little phrase. The voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Now let me ask you a question. What is the cool of the day? What part of the day, could I say, is the cool of the day? Well, it's the evening. It's when, as it were, the sun has dropped down below the horizon and darkness is just starting to set in. Just that little period of time where it's not dark and it's not light, but it's coming up to the night hour. Because you remember God created the great light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. And God comes down, as it were, in the cool of the day to talk with Adam. Now, could it be possible that Adam was busy during the day, Adam and Eve was busy during the day with all the legitimate things that occupied their hands? You remember God had placed the dominion the overseership, if you like, of this world into the hands of Adam and Eve. And there they were, busy looking after the garden, enjoying the provision and the fruit that God had given in their hands, looking after the animals, getting to know one another, just administering, and just overseeing the dominion that God had placed into their care and into their keeping. Now, if Adam and Eve were doing all that during the day, what do you think Adam and Eve were doing at night? You see, I don't believe Adam and Eve went to bed. You see, sleep really is a, an issue of the fall, isn't it? Because we're fallen creatures, because we are fallen in sin, after sin came into the garden, I would say Adam and Eve started to experience a tiredness that they'd never had before. And at night time, they had to go to bed. But if Adam and Eve didn't sleep during the night, what do you think they did? Well, I want to suggest to you, brothers and sisters, that if an Adam and Eve were working during the day over all the dominion God had placed into their hands, at night time they walked with God. At night time they communed with their great God of heaven as he came down from his great throne and walked with Adam and Eve through the midnight hours in the cool of the day. In the daytime, occupied with legitimate things that God had entrusted into their care and keeping. And at nighttime, they met and they communed with their great creator, God. You see, you can see the imminence of God. Oh yes, Genesis chapter 1 and 2, a great creator that is transcendent above all things. He would need to be transcendent in order to create everything. But yet one who was willing, as I say, to raise off his lofty throne and come down into the creation that he had made, just to walk, just to commune with Adam and Eve. And as you read down through this chapter, Genesis chapter 3, you can see, as it were, the whole drama unfolding before your eyes. You see, Adam was in the garden that day. It was no different than any other day he had been in it before. But something was going to happen that day in the garden that would change his experience forever. He would experience something in that garden that he had never experienced before. Eve came to him that one day with the fruit in her hand. 
And she handed the fruit to Adam. And Adam now had a choice to make. Would he side with God? Or would he side with his wife? And he reached forth with that love that he had for his other half. And he took of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. And he plunged the world into sin. And you can see Adam and Eve, their eyes being opened. And they scurried off into the nearest hedge to hide from God. The day comes to an end. The cool of the day starts to set in. And God, as it were, comes down from heaven to commune with Adam and Eve, just like he had done on previous days past. He met with Adam and Eve every day without fail and walked with them through the midnight hours. God was never late. And you can see, as it were, God walking. Verse 8, they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the cool of the day. In the Hebrew, that just simply means God was walking backwards and forwards. Yes, God knew where they were. But you can see, as it were, God pacing up and down the garden, waiting for Adam and Eve to come and commune with him. But instead of Adam and Eve turning up, they were hiding from the presence of God. And you know, friends, it reminds me this morning that in in the same manner, God wants to commune with us. And he wants us to commune with him. He hasn't changed. But you know, sadly, our lives have become so busy that we do not set aside the needed time where we might commune with the great God of heaven. Could I ask you this morning, maybe you're like Adam and Eve and you're hiding from God. You're busying yourself with all the legitimate things of time. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the work. The legitimate thing. But you're neglecting that quiet time and that communion with God. And sometimes we have to do it, and I have to do it, maybe more than most. Just take a little step back and assess all that is going on in my life. And make sure that God is getting first place in everything that I seek to do. But as I was in Genesis chapter 3, and as I was just going over it again, and familiarizing myself with the teaching out of the chapter, I asked myself this question. What was the curse of the fall that God put upon Adam? It was in the sweat of thy face. The curse that God placed upon the man was the curse of labor. And a lot of you gentlemen know what it is to have sweat, as it were, upon the brow when you're laboring. But then I asked myself the question, what was the curse of God upon the woman? I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception, and in sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. And thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. But you know, sadly, in the generation in which we live, sometimes the men don't want to work. Sometimes maybe the men work too much. And we don't wish and don't seek to be the head of our home. But the women, they want to take the man's curse of work, and hers of bearing children as well. You see, God knew what he was doing when he created man and woman. God knew what we could cope with. God knew what we could bear. And all the way back in Genesis here, he's laying out some very important teaching for us. He knew what man's frame was designed for. You see, man's frame was designed for physical work. Man's frame was designed for the pressures and for the rigors of providing for his home and for his family. Man's frame was designed, as it were, to be the head of the home, not to be a dictator, but to be able to lead and to be able to guide. Now, I would 
pretty much believe and be pretty guaranteed that there would be no one here in the assembly this morning would have any issues with me outlining the man's role within the home and the man's role within life. But I'm pretty sure that there's maybe some in the world, definitely, and there might even be some in the assembly this morning, that you would have a problem with what I would say about the issue of the woman's role. Well, if you go back to Genesis, as we've been doing in Genesis chapter 3, you will see that God knew the woman's frame as well. First of all, God designed the woman's frame that it might bear children. Not in the sense that that is the only thing that a woman is to do, but in the sense that man can't have children. And so a woman who is able to bear children and God's design, as it were, with regards to her frame, there is that woman or that motherly instinct to nurture, to raise, to bring up, to teach, to encourage the children that God entrusts into her keeping. You remember when we were studying Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 8. It said, the father was the instructor. It said that the mother was the teacher of the law. And that word instruction there with regards to the father was one who was an enforcer. One who was a disciplinarian. One who was an overseer. And so the husband's role within the home. He oversees. He ensures that the word of God is being properly and correctly administered in the home. This is his responsibility. The woman there, the teacher of the law. The word law we saw was the Hebrew word Torah. And not that the mother teaches the first five books of Moses, but that the mother seeks to teach the scriptures in all their fullness to the children that God has placed into their keeping. And if we go back to Genesis chapter 3, as painful as it might be for many, it was never God's desire that the wife, and I say the wife because I know some are not married, it was never God's desire that the wife share in the pressures and the toil of providing for the family alongside the husbands. That was Adam's and Adam's alone to bear because God knew the frame. And so if we men are stepping up to our duties as the head of the home and seeking to guide and seeking to lead and do all the things that are necessary in the word of God, we're seeking to do it in a biblical way. And what we do is we leave the dear, blessed wife of the home, one of the children, that she might pour all her life and all her desire into the children that God has entrusted into her care. You see, if I am doing my duty correctly as a man who is called of God and would have any gift at all in preaching the word, is not to make you successful in the world, but to make you satisfied with the Scriptures. And could I try and instill maybe into the younger families in the assembly the glory of raising children? The greatest gift that God will ever give you in the world is a little bundle that you bring home from the hospital. The greatest thing that you will ever do with your life is pouring your soul into your family. For all the things that you do out there will count for nothing. But all the things that you will do with your family will stand the very test of time and for eternity. And they're all back here in Genesis chapter 3. You see, as I have said, not everyone will get the experience of being married. Not everyone will have the experience of raising a child. Many want it. God's providence and sovereignty at times just doesn't forbid it. God only knows. But if you have a young family or you are family-minded, it was God's design 
One man, one woman, I don't need to tell you that. In a relationship with the one purpose of putting God first. One another second. That is the husband and wife. The children third. And everything else falling into line after that. You mightn't believe all that I've said. You mightn't say, well, I disagree with the brother in that instance. But I have tried to take it from the scriptures and from the word of God. And let us be willing to defend these precious gems in Genesis. Concerning the man and the woman. The family ideal. Because these are the things that are most under attack today. You say to me, what has that got to do with the imminence of God? Absolutely nothing. I haven't been able to work out a connection to it yet. But since we're in the book of Genesis, I just felt the Lord leading me to say that. But you notice that God, in his imminence, he doesn't just leave Adam and Eve in their sin. He doesn't just look down from heaven and see Adam and Eve have sinned and say, well, I'm not going to do anything about it. No, God calls out to Adam in grace. Adam, where art thou? Do you notice as well, sometimes the things that are not said in the word of God speak louder than the things that are. Do you notice that God called out to Adam and not to Eve? But surely Eve was the one who initiated the fall. Should God not have dealt with her first? No, here's another good home truth. God held Adam responsible for Eve's sin. And gentlemen, God will hold us responsible for what he has entrusted into our care and into our keeping. God will hold you and me responsible for the things that go on within the home. You see, God comes and he says to Adam, Adam, where art thou? God knew where he was. Adam was meant to be leading and guiding his wife. But instead, when his wife came to him, as the scripture says, the weaker vessel, Adam let her down. We know what happens next in the story. God draws near. A sacrifice is brought. Coats of skins are made to clothe Adam and Eve. And their transgression is covered. You can see the transcendence of God. Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2. He creates all things. You can see the imminence of God. Genesis chapter 3. He draws alongside his creation. Just to commune with them. And when they fall into sin, he reaches right down to where they are. And he makes a way whereby they can be forgiven. And you know, that brings us on nicely to what we mentioned last week. The greatest possible thought that we could ever have of God drawing near is in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. You might say to me, why take up teaching on the attributes of God? Or why teach or preach any, th any of the things that you have mentioned over the past few Sundays? Because they're so important. Because if we just preached about the transcendence of God, you and I would never be saved. God would be so transcendent, so outside this universe, that he would not, as it were, stain himself, stain his holiness with the sinfulness of man. And God could look down upon this creation from the very glory of heaven, and I say this with all reverence, he could say, I'm not saving them. I'm too outside this world I have created. I'm too transcendent, I'm too amazing, I'm too great in order to humble myself, to stoop down to that world that I created. But you know, on the other hand, if God is only imminent, if God could only draw alongside, and he wasn't transcendent, he wouldn't have the authority, he wouldn't have, as it were, the moral right 
the moral obligation to pass sentence upon our sin, let alone be a perfect sacrifice in Christ. Oh, my friend, the transcendence of God came down. How did he make the stoop? How did a transcendent God stay transcendent, but yet come down and be imminent to you and me? He did it in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, friends, as I have been enjoying these truths in my own quiet time over the past week or so, I reminded myself of Psalm 113, of a God who has to humble himself just to behold, just to look at the things in heaven and that are on earth. You got that the week we mentioned it. He has to take a great stoop just to turn around and look at the greatest thing he ever created. Tell me, if God had to take a great stoop just to behold the things that are in heaven and in earth, what must it have been for God to take on human flesh? What must it have been for God to step down in the person of Christ from the heights of glory to the sinful scenes of this time? And not only in condescension to come down from heaven to earth, but in humiliation to go to the death of the cross. And not only to go to the death of the cross, but to go down into death itself and to be raised again in a resurrected body. And to forever have human flesh. We sometimes say that beautiful phrase, there is a man in the glory. And I want to tell you, brothers and sisters in Christ, one of the greatest truths is this, is that the eternal word became flesh. And he will never ever cease to be flesh. And through the countless ages of eternity, as eternity laps upon the shores of glory, Christ will always be a man. What a stoop. The Lord Jesus had to take and taking on human flesh. Though he were rich, yet for our sakes he became poor. And I tell you, friends, we will never fathom just how rich he was, and just how poor he became. If you were to take the Queen of England this morning, and you were to strip her of her crown, and you were to strip her of every regal right of dignity that she possessed as a monarch of the nation, and you were to throw her out of Buckingham Palace, and her canopy was nothing more than the stars of heaven. She never ever stepped foot through a door again in her life. That would be nothing compared to the stoop that Christ took in order to come to this sinful earth. Now I want you just to turn, please, very quickly to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Because this is the greatest teaching on this subject in the Word of God. And I would encourage every brother in the assembly this morning, and when I say every brother, I mean every brother, to familiarize yourself with the teaching of Philippians chapter 2. Look what it says, and even the sisters as well, will not leave you out. You can get the teaching into your soul as well. But Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 to 8, look what it says. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. If I was to say to you this morning, what are the two most important words in that verse? You might say to me, God. You might say to me, equal. But I'll tell you the two most important words in that verse are the two smallest, the word in and the word with. Who being in The form of God. He was God. Who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He was God. He was with God. He was not only God, but he was God the Son. But made himself of no reputation. Took upon him the form of a servant was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. Oh, he humbled himself. And became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. 
The Lord Jesus made himself of no reputation. It literally means the Lord emptied himself. He emptied himself. He didn't empty himself, as it were, of any of his essential attributes. He didn't empty of himself of his deity. If he emptied himself of his deity, he would no longer be God. Sometimes we read Wesley's great hymn, He emptied himself of all but love. I would sing, He emptied himself and in his love. And what we have here in Philippians chapter 2 is rather than a strict for trick, strict translation, it's more of a commentary. He made himself of no reputation. The reputation that he shared with God, he was willing just to put it aside for a few times, for a moment, that he might leave the splendor of heaven to come down to this sin cursed scene of time in order to take on flesh, to be a savior for you and for me. If any of you gentlemen fail up to the test, women included, it's what's known as the kenosis, K-E-N-O-S-I-S. Our brother Alan there purchased a few commentaries on Schaefer. And if he goes home today and looks at the part of the Lord Jesus Christ, he'll find a nice little section teaching on the kenosis. And he'll go home and read it. And you could do a bit of study yourself if you want to look at these things. Christ, laying aside his glory, to take on human flesh. Is it sinking in? God becoming a man. Oh yes, we say that God died. But you know, God could not die. But the man who died was God. And so God came near. He came imminently close in the person of Christ for you and me. But there's something else. There's the other divine person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. Remember, he's divine as well. Don't leave him out. And this is really where the eminence of God comes so close to you and me. That through God, he would be willing, in the person of the Holy Spirit, to take up residence within your soul and within mine. It wasn't just that God came down to Adam. And it wasn't just then that God came down in Christ. But Christ went back up and ascended into heaven. And sent down the third person of the Trinity. That he could be eminently close to every single person upon this planet at the exact same time. The Lord Jesus Christ did not ascend into heaven. And the Holy Spirit did not come down. Christ could not be omnipresent in that sense. He could only come to you and I, one at a time. But the very fact that he ascended into heaven and the Holy Spirit came down, he can be eminently close, living within each and every one of us, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And you know, the most glorious thought of this is all, that within every single one of you this morning and of me, there's a little part of the transcendent God. For all eternity, we will ever have a part of the transcendent God living and dwelling within our souls in the person of the Holy Spirit. You see, that is why when we get saved, what do we receive? Well, Paul the Apostle says, But ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. And brothers and sisters in Christ, this is the connection that allows us to lift our heads heavenward and say, Abba, Father, the spirit of adoption. And he lives within you this morning. He is imminently close. And every trial and every situation that you might find yourself this morning. How close is he? He lives in here. If that isn't a stoop, I don't know what is. To think that God, the Holy Spirit, would leave the splendors of heaven and live within you and me, even knowing we are still capable of sin. Still capable of sin. Because when we allow our members to engage in that which is unrighteous, 
the Holy Spirit is there within our souls. And to think that the Holy Spirit could take up residence within our bodies without it affecting his holiness one iota. And yet he does it. And so how imminent is the Lord this morning? He dwells within our soul. The little hymn says, I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living. Whatever man may say, I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always here. He lives, he lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives. Salvation, to in part. If you ask me how I know he lives, he lives within my heart. Friends, we have a God who is big enough to oversee every situation, every difficulty that never might ever come our way. A transcendent and a providential God. But never allow that to blur out the fact that we have one who is imminent. Who draws alongside us in every problem of life. And there's never an issue and never difficulty that you will face. That he will not be beside you every step of the way. And as John 14 says from the very lips of the Lord Jesus, I will give to you another comforter. He shall not leave you comfortless. The next time you're going through a trial and you might say, where is your God? Or someone might say, where is your God? Just you say, he lives in here. And I can cry unto him at any time of my life, Abba, Father. And he hears. And he's able to meet me at the point of my need. May the Lord again bless his word for his name's sake this morning. And trust that we might allow these things to get into the depth of our soul. That God might be all in all. That he might be worshipped the way he ought to be worshipped. Let's just bow in a word of prayer before we sing. Father, we thank thee again for the word of God. We thank thee for the teaching of the scriptures. And we just ask this morning, our Father, that we would love this old book. That we would seek our Father to get ourselves into the place. That we would be willing, whatever might come, to obey it right to the very last jot and tittle. Father, we just ask again that the Lord Jesus would have total sway of our lives. That everything will be laid on the altar for him. Father, help us to take these great lofty truths and work them out as it were. Just our Father, as the very cogs of a motor, would work out from the engine and right down through all the small parts, right to the wheels, to the rubber that hits the road. We ask our Father we might take these great divine truths and work them out into the hands and feet and walk of our lives. And so our God bless us now again as we consider these things. And may the Lord Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, draw near, that we might feel the very imminent presence of God in our midst. We ask these things in the Saviour's name. Amen.